Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 68 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. Today I'm speaking with Brian Denson. Brian is a veteran investigative reporter who has written for publications including The Oregonian, The Houston Post, Newsweek, Reader's Digest, The Los Angeles Times, and many others. Over the course of his career, he has focused on true crime and government corruption or scandals on many occasions, resulting in some very memorable and award-winning stories. Recently, Brian published a three-book series for younger readers, which covers the hunt for famous criminals, including the Unabomber, famous American trader Aldrich Ames, and the investigation of the Portland bomb plot. But I invited Brian onto the podcast to talk about another book of his titled The Spy's Son, the true story of the highest-ranking CIA officer ever convicted of espionage and the son he trained to spy for Russia. It's quite a title, but it's also quite a story. I'm very excited to talk to Brian today about his work documenting a major espionage case that proved beyond a doubt that even after the Cold War ended, some things didn't change at all. But before we dive into this story, I want to say a big thank you to everyone listening who is also supporting me on Patreon, including Christian W. and Frank W. Your monthly contributions there help me keep this podcast going week in and week out. As a way of thanking my patrons, I offer a lot of great freebies and promotions, including free and discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. Patrons also get exclusive access to long-form articles of mine that aren't available anywhere else. If you haven't signed up for my Patreon yet, but you want to, just click the link in the show notes on whatever podcast platform you're listening to right now. Brian, thanks for making the time for this story today. This is a story I've wanted to feature here right from the beginning of this podcast, to be honest. Well, it's my pleasure being here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So can you just start by telling us how and when you first learned about this story to begin with? Sure. I It was January 2009. I got a call from a federal prosecutor and sort of source in Portland. I was working at the time at the Oregonian newspaper as the federal court beat writer. I'm not very happy about it. I um, had been doing a lot of investigative reporting before that, and now I was having to cover a beat and do investigative reporting. <laughs> so it was, this was a, a welcome case to, to walk across my transom. And I can tell you that when he, he called me, he said, we've got a pretty amazing case coming in today. It's coming into MAG court, which is magistrate's court. This is the court where they bring in freshly arrested criminals in federal custody for their day and, you know, before the magistrate. And I said, well, what is it? And he said, well, it's not a, not a phone conversation. And I understood exactly what he meant. And so I said, let me, let me jog down to the courthouse. And so I went down and he showed me an article that was written by really, in my opinion, the Dean of American spy writing, who's unfortunately no longer with us, David Wise, who I'm sure you know. <laughs> That's exactly um, who I was thinking of when you said that. Yeah, just a brilliant guy. And he'd written a story. He had gotten an exclusive interview with Jim Nicholson after his first arrest in 1996. And it laid out all of his infidelities to the United States and his various oaths of office. I uh, was very intrigued. And then he said, well, his son's coming in with him this time. And that really, really got me intrigued. Mm. Yeah, I can see how that would that would happen for sure. So you knew a fair amount about Jam Nicholson before you actually made it to the court that day. Is that right? I did. But let's keep in mind, I, this was my first cut as a spy writer. I didn't know the first thing about the world that you're talking about and have inhabited for some time. I was a I was very, very green. And I'll tell you, I was very lucky because after my first few stories appeared, I got a call from Brian Kelly. And I don't know if you know him. Oh, uh, yeah. I knew him. But Brian called and he told me that I was doing a couple things wrong. I was calling them CIA agents, not CIA officers, and you know, making some of the same rookie mistakes I guess every writer who, who falls into this world does. 
and he coached me up and and really really spent hours and hours on the phone and by email explaining the world that he once inhabited and that I was about to and so I was really grateful for that wow okay and I, I wasn't expecting that but and I don't want to go on too much of a tangent but this is Brian Kelly who was for many years suspected to be one of the moles. Is that correct? Is that the same Brian That's Kelly? That's right. He he was the same Brian Kelly who ultimately was put under bumper lock surveillance. He and one of his friends in the CIA, Kathleen Hunt, were followed all the time and uh, ruined his life for a couple of years before they discovered that, in fact, Robert Hansen was the mole, not mm. Brian Kelly, who had a chance to walk away from the CIA in disgust with the federal government, but instead went back and served out the rest of his career. And I just thought that was a really classy move by an American patriot. Yeah, absolutely. He is, he's on my list to cover in a full episode one day. So I don't want to get too much into that story because we're, we're talking about the Nicholson story today. But for the listeners, sure. definitely stay tuned. I, I plan to talk more about Brian Kelly in a future episode, certainly. So, Brian, at what point did you decide that this was worthy of a book? Was it days into this or weeks or months or, or something else? The day after I wrote the first story, the uh, the story of the arraignment of these two on these espionage charges, I got a call from a producer in Hollywood, and it occurred to me about that moment that there wasn't just a book in here, but there was probably a film in this. And I can talk a little bit about the, the film stuff later, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. But it's it's amazing that you were able to get there. I mean, you were able to see him in person and learn all about it and then just decide that you were going to devote so much time and effort to it. But clearly that paid off because here we are talking about this book, which was wonderful, quite frankly. Oh, thank you very much. Sure. So, well, let's go ahead and start with Nicholson's story then. So Jim Nicholson, as we mentioned, you know, he was a high ranking CIA case officer. Can you talk about his actual path into the CIA? Like what made him an attractive recruit in the first place? Sure. Both Jim's stepfather and mother had been in the military and knew the spy world just a little bit themselves. In fact, his stepfather had worked on the SR-71 spy plane. Mm. And so Jim came up as an ROTC guy at Oregon State University and went took various jobs. I think he made candles for Hallmark in the Midwest at one point. He was a young guy, married with a baby on the way, I think. He wound up in 1980 catching that wave that Ronald Reagan helped superintend, which was to bring in and build up the CIA with new officers. And Jim was, by all accounts, a blue flamer in the agency. He was smart and he was good looking and a case officer on the rise, no question about it. Hmm. So what kind of assignments did he get along the way after he completed his training? Sure. Well, Jim, as you know, served in what are called accompanied tours, meaning his wife and kids got to, to join him for those postings. He spent his days collecting intel on the streets in Manila and in Thailand and Bucharest. He actually did some cross-border ops in Thailand. Those were not accompanied tours, although he had his mistress there. Jim had a fellow case officer, I can't name him, but they became very, very close friends and were nicknamed by their station chief, Batman and Robin. So Jim earned the nickname Batman early in his career and wore it literally on his license plate at one time. Mm. You know, I think I knew that part. Did you did you mention the, the Robin case officer in the book? Because that's not ringing a bell at the moment, to be honest. I mentioned the case, I mentioned their exploits in Manila. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I know who he is. He has never wanted to be interviewed for this story, and I've never understood quite why. Hmm. Although he has, uh, by all accounts, had a, a very, very good career well, in the intelligence field. Hopefully, he'll open up a little bit more one day in the future. I hope he will call me as as soon as this podcast is on. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Well, let me be your second call then, if he uh, if he does call you. There you go. So what was it about Jim? You said he was a blue flamer. What was it about him that made him such a good case officer or at least a very straight to the top kind of guy, rising star? I think he was the kind of guy that you would want in the intelligence field or in journalism, frankly. He was bright, personable, quite capable, and quite capable of charming the pants off of people. Uh, <laughs> you know, precisely the kind of case officer the, the agency wants, right? Sure. As an aside, I should mention, he, he happened to also be 
stooping a lot of women who were not his wife <laughs> throughout his career. So, right, right, right. So that that actually that brings me perfectly to my next question. I know that although his career was on the rise, you know, over a period of a number of years, his marriage fell apart at around the same time, basically. And I know that he got married fairly early, but can you talk about what led to that other than the mistresses or, or you know, primarily the mistresses? Well, sure. Lori, his ex now, Alora, adjust me. She accused Jim of getting the maid pregnant in Manila. <laughs> then when they were in Bucharest, Jim was seeing spies under every sofa cushion. This was during the breakup of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And Lori was sort of anguished by all of Jim's affairs over the years. And so she decided to have one of her own. And it's a peculiar story. She had an affair with the veterinarian. His name was Radu. And this is mentioned in the book as well, but apparently I didn't know this, <laughs> but in Romania, the veterinarians make house calls, which made <laughs> Ra Radu very welcome in the, in the Nicholson home, at least mm. uh, by Lori. And mm. then after that, she, I think it was like on Easter Sunday or something, not too long after she began her affair, her affair with Radu, she wound up throwing her uh, wedding ring, ring, wedding ring she wound up throwing her wedding ring across the kitchen floor and said, I got to get out of here. And she took the kids back to the United States. And this caused Jim a whole lot of pain because he wanted, he had a lot of ego. Jim is an ex, a monstrous ego, in fact, almost unhealthy ego. And he wanted desperately to have his kids in his home. And ultimately he succeeded in doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how, at what what year did this marriage break up? Because you mentioned kids, so they were clearly together for a number of years there. Was this like early 90s at this point? Sure. The Soviet Union broke up, and very soon thereafter, Jim Nicholson's marriage broke up. Ah, okay. <laughs> Following the tides of history there, huh? Yes. So she left, but you mentioned that he, somehow he got custody of the children, which quite frankly is is astonishing to me. But did he make a, a compelling argument to the courts, or was there something else going on there with Lori? I read every piece of paper that was in the public record, which was not a lot. Lori had had the papers, but claims that she threw them away, and I don't have any reason to doubt her. I think it was an embarrassing episode for both of them. I think Jim charmed the pants off of the judge. That's my only explanation for how hmm. he might have pulled that off. Yeah, that is that is surprising for sure. I mean, I understand that he's got you know, the primary income or whatever, maybe the kids wanted to be with him, but a guy that travels to the dangerous corners of the world and is, you know, totally tied to his career and all that, getting custody of three kids is surprising to say the least. It's surprising at any, any, any time in right, history, right. having, having gone through a, a divorce ah. and a custody issue, hmm. which wound up being very amicable and we got a 50, 50 split, but getting a hundred percent would have been very, very difficult for me or anyone else. Right. Right. I can imagine, but Jim somehow pulled off you know, something totally unexpected, I guess. Not not the only unexpected thing he pulled off that yes. we're going to talk about, but happened. So all of this leads, I mean, he's a career guy who suffers a divorce and is traveling all around the world. There's nothing too astonishing really about this story yet other than the custody thing that we just mentioned. But what was it that wound up leading him to actually consider or commit treason, commit espionage? So after... Bucharest, he wound up being stationed in Kuala Lumpur. He had been the station chief in Bucharest, the station chief for the CIA there in Bucharest, and then wound up being the deputy chief of station in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. It was there he needed money to handle this divorce. And so he had some authorized meetings with his counterparts in the SVR. There was a time there, you may recall, where the CIA and the SVR were trying to work together because they, you know, the Soviet Union no longer existed. The old bad guys in Russia no longer existed, we thought. So Jim was in one of these authorized meetings and he just blurted it out. He said, I'm in trouble. I need $25,000. And the resident, the Russian SVR boss, said that this can be arranged. And soon Jim got the money. And once he had the money, he was their boy. And he traveled the world passing information and documents to his handler. Hmm. Yeah, that's amazing to me. And you, you do bring up a really good point that they weren't 
at for a brief period anyway, we didn't see the Russian government, the new Russian government, as our enemies in the same way that we had just a couple of years prior to that's that. a really that's a really good point and let me let me throw the, the the backdrop here and in early i guess it was april 94 the fbi arrested alder james who had just made you know millions over the years not just mm-hmm. i mean had been for years making millions selling secrets to the kgb and 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 the and the svr when it when the changeover came jim volunteered he was a walk-in at the the russian embassy <laughs> <laughs> or at the, mm-hmm. at the CIA station, the SBR CIA station in Kuala Lumpur. And, you know, he just, did, I guess, didn't really imagine or didn't think about what he had done. He, he later, it was, I think it was exactly two months or thereabouts. I think Ames was arrested in April, and I think Jim walked in in June. And I just don't think he really thought about what that really, really meant. And he later told Katie Couric, you can find it on old TV clips, I did. He said, I thought there might have been an opening, (laughs) which is hopelessly naive. If you know, there's always multiple, you know, penetrations of every spy service. And, you know, and usually they're micro penetrations, right? But you can always expect that there's somebody and that there's a very easy way to get caught Mm -hmm. doing that and of course we had penetrations and there was someone in the russian federation who had been in the kgb working for the cia and later the svr and we'll get to him in a minute i suppose but you know he was able to point the finger at jim right right of course i'm just i'm totally shocked that he would number one that he would consider this just weeks like you said weeks after the ultra james arrest which was you know, just the most incredibly public thing imaginable at the time, and and possibly someone that he knew personally. I would I would imagine that community being relatively small. So why would he think that you know, with the eyes of the world on Ames, that he should go to practically the same people as Ames had gone to and and sell out? I mean, it's yeah, it's, it's really for a guy who's very smart in so many ways. It, it really kind of makes you wonder, and I, I wonder if he just thought that he would be able to, you know skirt the counter espionage people or just use his tradecraft to never be detected or or something like that. Do you have any thoughts on that at all? Like what would have made him, you know, confident enough to try this? Jim Nicholson has never walked into a room in his life, this is my opinion, without believing he was the smartest boy in the room. <laughs> okay. And I saw it firsthand in in the courtroom a few times where he was standing and sort of gazing just over the the foreheads of everybody in the room as if he was ready to tee off on a on a 18 hole golf course hmm. and just as relaxed as can be again <laughs> very spy like if you think about it but also extremely arrogant yeah, well, that seems like it was certainly his downfall or one of the things that contributed in a big way to his downfall in the end. So I know that initially the the Russians were concerned that this was some sort of dangle, you know, which had happened on both sure. sides in the oh, past. Yeah. But he was he was totally legit. So how did that relationship develop over time? I mean, he must have had some incredibly valuable stuff for them, right? He did. The most valuable ultimately came, you know, he was meeting with his handler all over the world and getting, you know, getting some tasking. But when, when he wound up going to the farm, that was after, after Kuala Lumpur, he was sent to the farm to be a, an instructor. And it was there that he began to really pick the pockets of the CIA. He gave up the names of hundreds of career trainees and handed them over to the Russians. So, the Russians would know everybody who was working for the CIA, all the young officers, they'd know them by name. <laughs> they'd know them by, by you know, their characterizations. And, and it, that's, not only did it put them at potential risk, it also ended a lot of careers because they were made. How can you do, how can you do spying if you're an American CIA officer, if you're already known to the other team? Oh, I know it. I know it. It's amazing. That's, that really is, I mean, even for, you know, I, I devote this podcast, obviously, to espionage and betrayal and treason and that kind of thing. But that really is one of the most despicable ways, in my opinion, to betray your organization, 
because you can't justify something by saying that, you know, I'm giving them information from two years ago. For example, those people have left country, the situation has changed, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's really no denying that you are, you know, hurting a crop of idealistic young people who are about to go out in the world. And now they're in 10 times the level of danger of capture or humiliation or torture or execution, you know, from some of the third parties that the Russians might be working with. All of that is now possible specifically because you were their instructor and you chose to give it up. So that's, it, it really kind of boggles the mind that of all things, he would give that away. So true. And here's the kicker. Jim had trained some of those very CTs himself, eyeball to eyeball, face to face, taught those CIA officers in training <sighs> and gave up their names. Has he ever offered, to your knowledge, any kind of a justification for that, like saying, well, you know, the Russians don't really kill our people or, or anything like that? Has he ever explained why he chose to give that away that you know of? I don't recall. I imagine he spoke about it at great length during his debriefings, not once, but twice mm -hmm. in his life. Right, right. Right. He's a repeat offender, to say the least. Yep. So he, he gave away a lot. Was he, how well paid was he? Do you have any idea like what the total amount of money that he received over his time spying for the Russians? It was, I believe, $350,000. It wasn't Ames money. It wasn't Hanson money. It was, he was just getting started. Okay. Wow. How, how long did this go on for exactly from the first meeting till his arrest, I guess? Oh, let's see. I don't have my timeline right in front of me. I know that he was arrested in 96 mm -hmm. and... He, he, so it was 94 to 96. It was a couple of years. Okay. It was two and a half years, probably. Okay. Okay. So that, that's a pretty significant amount of money on top of your salary, especially if you're considering, if you're planning for the long haul, like it sounds. Yes. Like. And keep in mind, Jim was at that time, the highest ranking CIA officer mm -hmm. ever known to be betraying the CIA. Right. So he was yeah. making, he was making about $80,000 a year, which in today's money is what, you know, 145,000 mm -hmm. a year or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm assuming that when he's overseas, he's not paying for housing. So a lot of that money, it's not disposable income, but that money goes even farther than we might imagine if you're on an overseas posting, I would I would think. That's exactly right. That's true of the CIA, the Foreign Service, and all of our foreign folks over, mm -hmm. over outside of the United States. Yeah. So was he passing this stuff at personal meetings or was he doing dead drops or, you know, a, a number station radio kind of transmissions, anything like that? How was he actually these were, getting These were the same kind of drops that, that Rick Ames was pulling off. You know, they were <laughs> meetings in restaurants and foreign ports of call, and they were dropping files in bags, and another bag would slide under the table with money in it. Hmm. Wow. I mean, I can understand the thrill of all that, but the face-to-face -face meetings are the, the most dangerous time, I would think. But, I mean, well, he would know that because he trained it and he lived it, but he still did it. Yeah. Yeah. So do you know what he provided besides the names of those trainees? Do you know anything else that he was able to provide? Not offhand. That book came out in 2015. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's been seven years and I, I, I think there were some things, but I, I just right off the top of my head, I don't recall. I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I just read it a couple of weeks ago, but I don't recall off the top of my head either. Yeah. But I know that he provided a lot. Were they, to your knowledge, were they asking him for stuff or he, did he just say, this is what I have at the moment? The, the real tasking of Jim for information in his head came later after, after he was in prison, which mm. we'll get to, obviously, right, in right. a couple of minutes. So you kind of alluded to it earlier, but how was he finally caught? Like, at what point did an investigation turn towards him and why? Well, there, it's public now, but there is a rather famous... U.S. defector, a Russian defector to the U.S., Alexander Zoporoshky. You've probably heard that name. Yes. Yeah. And he helped point the way toward Hansen and Ames and another spy and Jim Nicholson. And they, he didn't have specifics about like names, ranks, that sort of thing. But what, what Zoporoshky was able to provide the U.S. intelligence apparatus was things like, in, in Nicholson's case... He was able to say there was a spy I've heard about, CIA, working in Malaysia, who then went and worked at, at the covert training center, the farm, mm. for the CIA. And so that was very easy to triangulate sure. if you were getting that information inside CIA and FBI. Sure, 
Sure. And that's how that's how he was originally identified. And I don't know to this day, even even after all the research I've done, and I it's about <laughs> eight file drawers worth of stuff and a whole lot of electronic files uh, that that don't contribute to that. I don't know, you know, precisely what Jim was thinking. <laughs> yeah, I just it's don't. Hard to I mean, imagine I, I, other than I'll get away with it, I guess. Yeah. I guess he thought he could outsmart everybody who would who would come looking for him anyway, but that was betrayed. I, I think, him. as I said before, I think Jim is one of those guys who walks through life believing that he's the smartest guy in the room. And, I, you know, I, a part of that you would want to applaud, right? If you were a CIA station chief and this guy worked for you, you'd be, all right. <laughs> mm -hmm. But if you're a human being, work, you know, living in a room or you're married to the guy, I suppose, that's not always the best best scenario. Right, right, absolutely. And I don't think it's in the book, but can, can you talk a little bit about what happened to Zaporoshky after that? I plan to actually cover that in the future, but I know that he, he popped up a few times after all of this occurred, didn't he? Zaporoshky has been very, very good to the United States <laughs> to, <laughs> yeah. to, to, to train on a, what was it, an old Saturday Night Live sketch. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, Alexander Zaporoshky and several other spies who we got back in the Spy swap back in 2010 were quite good for the United States and Great Britain, no question about it. Right, he was he was on our payroll, but he ended up getting arrested anyway. After I think after he defected, right? Wasn't he lured back to Russia at some point after he defected? Yes, he was. He was. Yeah, I really want to get to the bottom of that. How he was lured back specifically? Because I've heard some crazy stories, and I want to know if they're true or not. But I, I know he was I can tell back you. I, I can tell you the story if you want to okay, hear it. Okay, yeah, please. He. Please. he he had lunch with a high-ranking CIA officer who I know very, very well, who had lunch with him, and he said, just casually, over fish, I'm going back. And he said, the CIA officer said, what? He said, yeah, I'm going back. And he says, where? He says, Russia. <laughs> and off he went. And against the advice of the CIA, which told him that he, you know, likely faced prosecution. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. He hmm. was put in irons when he got there. This is all very public. It's all part of the public record. Right. He, the, the, the counterintelligence chief had a particular vendetta against Oparoshki and had lured him back for a KGB reunion. Yeah. Oh my and, gosh. That's what I heard. I was wondering if that was true. Like he was, he was offered a chance to come back and see his old pals and he thought that that was legitimate? He, somehow he did, and somehow yeah. he believed he was smarter than everybody else in the room, and could could go back and and all would be all would be well with the world. Oh, that man. enough time had passed, enough water under the bridge had gone by, and sure enough, he went. Again, this is all in the public record. You can read this in multiple magazine and newspaper stories, but uh, bits and pieces of it point out that you know Zaporoshky was very very good to the United States for a long long mm -hmm. time. Yeah, I would love to hear it from him because now that he's back in the United States, I, from what I understand, from what I've read, and, and you probably know better than I do, he's definitely keeping a lower profile these days than he did in the past. But if he's around, I would certainly like to interview him one day and get his whole story. But totally, I've been trying to get that interview for years. <laughs> I went to his doorstep in Baltimore, just north of Baltimore, not mm -hmm. too far from where I where I went on my first car date mm -hmm. in high school, and I knocked on the door, and this was the second home. And after he'd gotten back. And I heard classical music playing upstairs, but no one, no one answered the door. <laughs> oh man! I later found out that he was into classical music, so it must yeah. have been. Him. Oh wow! Right there on the other side of the door, and he wouldn't talk to you. That's unfortunate, but probably not right behind the door. But yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah, I hope that he opens up a little bit more in the future, in a, in a way that protects himself at least. But I would. He, he he's an American hero. Mm -hmm. Alexander Zaporoshky is an American hero, and. Yeah, I agree. He's done more for the United States that hasn't been made public, I'm sure, than has been made public. Right, right. I, I think that we probably know 10% of his story if you put it together from all the different things that have been written about him. And I would love to hear the whole story one day, but you know, who knows if that'll happen. Mm -hmm. Wow. Great, great, great. Well, okay. So on to Nicholson. Anyway, so he was betrayed by Zaporoshky, as you mentioned. And But that still meant that a criminal investigation had to occur because the word from one individual doesn't necessarily make for you know absolute evidence. So how did they begin this investigation into him? I mean, it must have been shocking to go after a guy who was, what, like a, a GS-15 or something 
like that. So then like it becomes S S one or yeah yeah S S one or something. So he would have been whatever the top GS ranking is. That's what he was. Mm-hmm. So they started a a criminal investigation to him at that point. I guess did the FBI initiate that investigation? The the sure. I mean, whenever whenever the CIA believes that they have a traitor in their midst, they they will ultimately and <laughs> sometimes even a little bit reluctantly bring in the FBI, mm-hmm. which takes part in the end. You know, you know, the whole story of the Ames investigation, the CIA and FBI worked pretty closely together on that one, only because it was very hard to identify who the bad guy was for the longest time. Right. And right. So, you know, in this case, Nicholson hadn't been active that long. I mean, Ames had been active for years and years and years. He was working for the KGB and then ultimately the SVR. But Nicholson had only worked for the SVR and only for, like I say, you know, two, two and a half years. Mm-hmm. So what was the the moment that they finally kind of like caught him, like the, the smoking gun evidence, <clears throat> so to speak, that he was actually, you know, passing along secrets to a foreign intelligence service? Yeah, it's a great story. So Jim fell under investigation from the FBI. There was enough to open a criminal investigation, a criminal espionage investigation. And they, two agents <laughs> posing as husband and wife, bought the townhome next door to Jim Nicholson. Meanwhile, inside CIA, there was a man, he won't mind me mentioning his name, John McGuire. He's in the book. John McGuire was a CIA officer who had gotten in a little bit of trouble with his bosses and had been busted down from field work to a position in human resources. And he was down there one day when he gets a call, and it was from the his boss's executive assistant. And Anna was her name. And she said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm trying not to kill myself in my seat. <laughs> she said, she said, I understand. Come up to me. I think the boss has got something for you. And so later that day, after a conversation with his boss and the CIA and the FBI agent who was standing next to him in the room, Ed Curran, who identified himself as the top FBI official inside CIA. And you'll remember, I don't know if you remember this, but back in after the Ames case, which took a long, long time to resolve, the Clinton administration, Clinton's edict was that the CIA and FBI would both have people from the opposite agency in their own building. So there were supposed to be CIA officers in the FBI building who were, you know, helping them stay, you know, clean and out of trouble. And same with the CIA. And ultimately, Ed Curran and John McClurg were two of the, the really high-ranking FBI officials who worked inside CIA as, as counterintelligence people. And the CIA never got anybody inside FBI. <laughs> so, I mean, they did a lot of crazy... I mean, the FBI did a, I, I don't want to say a proctologic <laughs> investigation of Jim, but it was the next best thing. I mean, they, they, they bought the house next door. They were running surveillance of all different kinds from their electronic surveillance. They you know, they searched his minivan (laughs) that he drove the kids around and they found his Toshiba laptop that the Russians had given him. Inside CIA, they mounted a pinhole camera over his desk. And there's a great story in the book. John McGuire's in the office one day who was serving as Jim's deputy. He, He wound up getting hired by Jim into that position, though he was actually working for the the criminal investigation team. Mm -hmm. He gets a call on, I forget what was a blue phone or a red phone or a yellow phone or some phone. He gets a call and and they said, you know, what the hell is he doing now? And he said, he's standing on his desk. And Jim was standing on his desk looking at the little acoustic tile, the little holes in it, which is where the the camera had been positioned. Mm -hmm. And clearly thinking, maybe they're on to me or (laughs) maybe, maybe I should at least check, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, so John walks in, he goes, hey, Jim, what are you doing? Redecorating? <laughs> <laughs> he jumps down. And as far as we know, that's that's the last that Jim looked up there. Hmm. But yeah, they watched him. He was doing, he was, he had, he had requisitioned, he had <laughs> one of the people who worked in his office, a, a, a truly, truly fascinating woman, Kathleen Hunt, who worked in that branch for John McGuire and Jim Nicholson, un- unaware that he was under criminal investigation. She wound up going to John saying, Jim is making these very strange requisitions for a guy who works in a branch office that's supposed to be 
poking holes in foreign terrorist groups. And John's like, what are you talking about? She said, well, he requisitioned a briefcase that has a camera attachment where you can shoot pictures of documents inside the, the case and mm-hmm. a special spy camera to do it with. Mm-hmm. And, and McGuire, knowing that she was starting to get close and the investigation couldn't have somebody who was asking questions, specific, especially if she would go to Jim with these questions, said, oh, that's just Jim. He's an eccentric. You, you got to just let him go. He's fine. Mm-hmm. So he was doing some stuff that he was copying documents and carrying them out of the building and trying to sell them and, and was selling them to the Russians. Mm-hmm. So eventually they have enough to arrest him. So how exactly did the arrest itself go down? One of the coolest arrests, no, not one of the coolest, the coolest arrest story that I have ever written about in my life. They waited until November of 1996. Jim's on his way to Switzerland. He's <laughs> he's going there ostensibly for business, but he's really going there to visit his Swiss bank account and, and meet his Russian handler. And so he says goodbye to Nathan and Star. He's in his little town home in Burke, Virginia, and off he goes. Little does he know that there is an an immense <laughs> FBI surveillance team awaiting him. They followed him from his home as he was being taken to the airport with Star and Nathan, his kids, two of his kids in the in the in the van. Uh, his brother Rob was driving. They let him off, and Jim was under surveillance the whole way, from the house to the airport. When he got into the people mover, going across the, you know, to the to the tarmac, down the corridor. There's this great scene in the book where two FBI agents, a man and a woman posing as husband and wife, and dressed as tourists, are about to get on the same plane, and they, Jim stopped or did something and they had to sort of hold up for a minute and so he said hey we have to manufacture something we're going to look suspicious if we're standing here while he's pausing and so they started a shouting match screaming at (laughs) each other and you know posing as a very unhappy married couple jim walks past walks on to the tarmac and a guy named steve hooper says hey and hooper by the way was dressed in an american airlines jacket that he had borrowed he yells, hey, Jim, Jim Nicholson. And Jim looks around like, hey, this must be one of my friends. What's What the heck? And he's heading to this airplane. That's It's a commuter plane that's going to take him to New York. And then ultimately, he's going to catch a plane to Switzerland. And he's got 73 rolls, I think, of film in his, uh, his shoulder bag. And Steve Hooper, who was a hockey player, walks over and grabs him by the arm and says, it's over, Jim. You're under arrest. Oh, man. And took him over and let the, the the heads of counterintelligence for the FBI and CIA have their way with him. And they bent him over the back of the, the, the car and arrested him right there. Wow. But at every moment, from the moment Jim left that place to the moment he was arrested, there were dozens and dozens of people, people in the people movers, people on the tarmac, people in the, in the airport, all of them FBI agents. Wow. Even for them, I know that's their job and their profession, but it must be pretty exciting to get like a, such a high level arrest. Just, you know, all the the watchers, you know, all the people that are involved, even tangentially, you know, that's got to be pretty exciting for them to get such a high level guy, especially from another agency. It's a career case. And yes, you're right. There's no love lost between those two, right, two right. government agencies. So that was the end of his spying, you would think, normally. But as for Jim, he's the very, very rare guy that that didn't actually put him down for the count, did it in the end, the arrest and his eventual conviction and his prison sentence. No, it was only part one. And some of the folks I've talked to in in the agency and the bureau have referred to him as the double hitter. (laughs) (laughs) He's the only CIA officer ever to pull it off twice. And the second time, of course, he's going to do it behind bars, right? Unbelievable stuff. Unbelievable stuff. Uh, Yeah, I, I can't. Yeah, it's hard to wrap my head around this story, even though it's years old and it's so well documented by you and by others as well. But it's really something else. The the ego on this guy and the the boldness of his actions, it's it's amazing stuff, honestly. Yep. I want to tell you all about my new favorite fragrance for daily wear. It's called Novichok by Clandestine Laboratories. Novichok is distinctive and combines notes of cocoa powder, 
chocolate almond tort, rose, jasmine, cinnamon, tonka bean, Peru balsam, and musk tonkin. Unlike some of the other colognes I've worn in the past, I found that Novichok stays with me all day, which was a pleasant surprise. If the name sounds familiar to you, then you might already know why I was so happy to find this company and support them. The name itself comes from the very well-known Russian nerve agent Novichok, which has been used in recent years in several assassination attempts, which I've covered here on the podcast in previous episodes. The name is spelled differently, but rest assured, once you put this on, you'll still make a killer impression wherever you go. Novichok is made in small batches by clandestine laboratories and, like their entire lineup, is available only via direct order. If you're not sure which of their fragrances is right for you, you can also check out the Discovery Stash, six different mini bottles, at one great price, which is perfect for finding your signature scent. So make sure to check them out either via a link in the show notes of this episode or at their website, clandestinelaboratories.com, or on Instagram, at clandestinelaboratories. So, Brian, I I have to wonder, why is it that even from inside prison, Jim chose to continue to commit espionage against all odds? Well... He wanted to reestablish contact with the people on the same team, and that same team being the SVR. Mm -hmm. They were his, you know, he was their boy. And mostly he wanted money from them, which he knew would be helpful to his kids, who were all adults at this point and were struggling financially with some college debt and that sort of thing. So was it? Do you think it was more for the kids than anything else? Was that the prime motivator, or was his, his ego perhaps a, a major factor as well? Ego is a huge factor in everything that Jim does. <laughs> I thought so. Yes. Jim wanted the kids to be happy because he wanted the kids to keep coming to see him at the prison, which they were going to do anyway. They love their father. And he wanted to be there and be able to give them some money. And that Gate that made that fed his ego to be able to do that. Yeah, that was one thing that surprised me. And we've obviously been speaking about all of his negative qualities this whole time, really. But he was quite a doting and, and loving father in many ways, and it was it was reciprocated by the kids as well. They were very close to him, weren't they? They were, and I will tell you, they still love their father quite a lot, though his ex wife doesn't love him very much, <laughs> right? Uh, right. But you know, uh, Jim's a complicated guy, but for that. His love for his children is real, mm-hmm. but his, his ego is large. And I think if, if I've never been able to speak to him, I've never been allowed to speak to him. But if he were in the room here, I would love to ask him that question. Hey, you know, how could you have done this to your kid? How could you have put your kids in this situation? How could you have embarrassed your family not once but twice? But he's a complicated guy, and he really felt... I believe, based on all the research, that he really wanted to get money into specifically Nathan and Starr's hands. I think Jeremy was already in the military. He was in the Air Force at that time. And I don't think Jeremy was struggling the way that that certainly Nathan was. Nathan was, you know, I think had student debt, though he was he had a disability rating from the Army after a parachuting accident. And Nathan really needed the money. And Nathan was the most like his dad. He was the one who really was, he described, Nathan sort of described at one point the way that they would both sort of dress up and, you know, they were sort of peacocks as Nathan described it. Hmm. And that makes a lot of sense to me. And, and their voices are very similar. I have heard Jim's voice before and their voices are similar. They carry themselves similarly. They look different. I think Nathan looks as much like his mom as he looks like his dad, but Jim just had a different I'm trying to be polite here. I think Jim just had a different way of looking at the world and looking at his place in that world. Does that make Mm -hmm. sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He seems to have seen everybody else as kind of beneath him, you know, in a way, is is the impression I'm getting. Like he Well, well, I think he saw people as disposable, except for the people in his immediate orbit, who he would Mm -hmm. do anything for, as as evidenced by his second round of espionage. Right. Right. So how did that begin? I mean, I understand his motivation to make money and he's still got some stuff in his head that might be valuable. But how in the world do you from inside of a a federal prison, how do you make contact with a foreign intelligence entity? I mean, that's hard enough when you're outside and traveling all over the world as he was in the past. Well, sure. The answer is simple. He treated his youngest son, Nathan, like a garden variety asset. He turned him into a courier for the SVR. 
And in fact, I'll tell you, as I've described Nathan to a number of people, he was his dad's last asset. In fact, that was the the working title of the spy son when I first, during the first few passes through the manuscript, was the last asset. But mm. the word spy has to be in the title because, you know, search engine right, optimization right. and being what it is, right? Nathan was indeed his dad's last asset. And so he was the one he reached out to. He was the one who was most likely. Nathan was the one who was adventurous enough to to carry out whatever Jim wanted him to do. And that he could count on his, and that he could count on Nathan. Wow. So, yeah, it's very hard for me to wrap my head around his motivations as well, in a way, just because common sense would dictate that this is going to end badly. You know what I mean? And I mean, obviously, common sense doesn't always play into interpersonal relationships, (laughs) you know, love and that sort of thing. But, you know, it seems like he should have thought, especially like after he gets out of the room with his father, the, you know, the, the common room, the meeting room or whatever it's called at the prison, he should have kind of, you know, the cooler head should have prevailed a little bit, but that's, that's not what happens. So how exactly did Jim convince his son to take up the mantle of espionage for the family? Well, let me just go back for one second. You said, you know, common sense would, would suggest, right, right. and I just don't think that there was a lot of common sense thinking here. And I think that if, even if you have common sense and you happen to be someone with a powerful ego, you think that you're above it, that you're not Mm going to get caught. And I'm sure that Jim and a lot of other criminals who are in that same prison or were in that same prison together, including by the way, two, two other major spies. (laughs) Did I ever, did did you know that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. They're mentioned in the book a couple of times. I think I can't pull their names immediately. But so um, Jim was serving his sentence at Sheridan Federal Correctional Institution. It's a medium security prison, although he wound up in the ad seg unit there after he was arrested. But for the second time. But Christopher Boyce served time with Jim Nicholson. And so did James Derward Harper, both of whom I interviewed after after the book came out. I mean, they were both cold, major Cold War spies. Yeah, I've actually, I, I was able to get in contact with Christopher Boyce as well for the podcast. Unfortunately, he declined to be interviewed. He said he's no longer doing interviews. So if he ever changes his mind, maybe I'll get him on here in the future. But I'm glad that you were able to interview him at least. I spent a lot of time with Chris and his then wife. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. Yeah, he's an interesting guy from everything I've read. So I'd love to hear his story. Well, they lived his... here in Oregon. You know that. I mean, after prison, that's where he wound up. So oh, is it? yeah, I, yeah, I, I probably I went out that. to their place and and. I have a very funny picture on my website somewhere of Chris Boyce sitting there, and I had made a little snowman. <laughs> mm-hmm. He was showing me his falcon, and so I, I made a little snowman and had him sit down with it. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I just remember the guy bursting out laughing and saying, you're crazy, you're crazy, oh, you're man. crazy. Oh, wow. Yeah. I got to look for that. Good. Yeah. So he's in there with these guys, and you know, a minute ago you said that they think they're going to get away with it, and that's pretty funny coming from a guy wearing an orange jumpsuit, you know, for espionage, thinking, okay, they caught me the first time, sure, but this time I'm going to outsmart them. Yeah. But he went ahead and did it anyway. Yeah. yeah so he yeah. got his son to contact the SVR, but what did he still have at that time that was valuable? I mean, was it just stuff that he still remembered, basically, stuff that he hadn't already given up to them or, or something sure. else? Sure. Yeah. Jim had... Obviously, excellent recall for all the places he had traveled before and after his espionage for the SVR. Well, so the (laughs) SVR wanted to find out how Jim might have come under suspicion. And it's my belief they were looking for the traitor in their midst who gave him up, which was Alex Saparoshki. Yeah. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. That would make it very valuable. Any clue that he could provide, uh, whether it came up, I guess, in court or in the debriefings or, or whatever, I guess anything would be worth quite a bit of money if they could zero in on Zaporoshki. Well, the one question that I can recall that was asked once or twice of Nathan to pass to his dad is, where do you think you were when you fell under suspicion? Mm. And that would have been a way of them trying to identify times and places and, and putting it together something of a matrix to figure out where, who might have been in a position in those various spots to, mm-hmm. to betray him. Right, right. That's all very important stuff if they've got a bunch of analysts on it and counterintelligence people and all that. So Nathan is willing to meet with these guys. Do you know how they set up the original meeting? Like how did Nathan actually get face to face with an SVR guy the first time around? So let me just first say that Nathan was a pretty easy mark for the old man. Nathan was at a very low point in his life. He had just washed out of the army in a parachuting accident, broke a bone in his lower back. 
wound up getting a 40% disability rating from the army. And at one point he's living in an apartment off the base, I think, recovering, and he was suicidal. And he reached into a box, he had a knife or knives in there and picked out a knife and he was about to kill himself. And the phone rang and it said, you have a collect call from a federal institution. And then his dad's voice is on there. And he's, and Jim said to him, this is according to Nathan, something like, God told me to call you. Oh, and wow. that's a very powerful moment in Nathan's life because here was his father essentially saving his life. My gosh. And this yeah. is the father that, in spite of Jim's arrest as a traitor, his imprisonment as a traitor, he never, ever, ever lost his love for his father. And I think our relationships with our fathers are sometimes complicated. There's more than most because of the circumstances. But at the, at the end of the day, there's always a desire by the, the, the son to impress the father. And I think Nathan had that in, in triplicate. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. And he's, you know, impressing him, helping him, following in his footsteps. You know, there's a lot of things there that can kind of override that that common sense that we mentioned a few minutes ago. And, um, you know, the the financial gain there at a very low point in his life was kind of icing on the cake, to say the least, I'm sure. Well, and, and quite clearly, Nathan didn't just love his dad. He, he would have done virtually anything to help him. Hmm. And his... Dad was very coy. He went along with his plan. He just, he's, you know, he loved his dad and wanted to remain close to him. And when his dad asked him to smuggle some messages out of the prison and carry them to some old Russian pals, Nathan agreed. He said, I have some messages I'd like for you to carry to the Russian consulate in San Francisco. And Jim probably knew. I can't imagine that Jim wouldn't know that every consulate, foreign consulate in the United States, particularly the Russian one, <laughs> <laughs> the Russian embassy in D.C. has FBI agents looking at it from every different angle. Every car that goes out of there with diplomatic plates or, or private plates, anybody who's sitting too long in front of the embassy or the consulate, they're under watch. Mm -hmm. So Jim was telling Nathan things like, be careful, you know, keep an eye out, you know, don't, you know, just get in and get out, you know, and carry these messages. And ultimately, Nathan goes the first time, and they they turned him away. They said, "We we have you know we don't believe you you are Jim Nicholson's son, and go away." And so they vetted him, and the next time they said, "Come back in two weeks." And so, and that's pretty standard for the Russians. They're not going to just immediately bring you in, they because it you know it could be a provocation, right? It could be some sort of sure, a trick sure. by the U.S. government. And he comes back the second time, and Nathan said they bear hugged him. <laughs> they were thrilled oh, to wow. see him. How's your dad? You know, <laughs> and then they gave him five thousand dollars, and that's when Nathan made a little error and launched the second investigation. Oh man! So what was that error that he made exactly? On the ride home from the second trip, I believe it was Nathan. I should back up and tell you was trying to sell insurance, particularly to old people, I think. Uh, it was, I forget what kind of insurance it was. And he's honest to a fault, <laughs> actually. If you, if you knew him, you'd be, you'd be surprised how honest he is. And was unable to sort of be, you know, salesman-like with old people and, and felt guilty trying to take their money and ultimately quit the job, which is another reason that Nathan needed money. But he was in this car heading home and Jim calls and says, how you doing, son? He goes, I'm doing fine. And he says, how's everything going? He says, oh, yeah, I did great. It made a sale for 5K. And that was picked up by a very on the ball CIA analyst. <laughs> All hmm. of Jim's calls and letters were analyzed by the CIA. They, the letters were copied. I recently talked to the guy who wound up getting all of the mail for Jim at his home. It was a weird arrangement. But ultimately, the mail wound up going to the CIA. It was all of everything that Jim wrote was studied by analysts. 
and so were all of his phone calls. And when Nathan said, uh, yeah, they were nice, and you know, I made a sale for 5K, that rang some, some bells. And so the next thing you know, there are a couple of CIA officers walking into the FBI headquarters here in Portland saying they wanted to talk to the head of counterintelligence. Pretty soon you have three really, really sharp and very, very different FBI agents pouring through and working to make yet another espionage case against Jim Nicholson, mm. this time with his son. Wow. Yeah, I can imagine. So did Nathan at any point, I know that he made several trips. Did he start to have second thoughts about any of this or was he just happily contributing the whole time up until the end? I, I think he fretted a little bit, but I think he was so proud to help his mm. dad and be a little sneaky and live the sort of clandestine life, as he described it, that his dad had lived, that he saw himself, I think, a little bit as sort of a, a, a junior James Bond, right? Mm. But I think Nathan recognized that he was really just, <laughs> you know, kind of just taking, he was kind of, kind of paddling. I mean, there's a, there's a scene in the book that's just, to me, is it tells you more about Nathan than, than you'd ever want to know. It's He's in Mexico City. He's made this huge score. He's got, I think it was $10,000 they gave him. And he's feeling filthy rich. It's Christmas time. And what does Nathan do? Does he go to the bullfights? Does he go to a bar and drink a bunch of tequila? Does he does he find a hooker? I just, does he do any of these things that a young guy might do on the streets of Mexico City? No. Nathan buys a, a, a discount <laughs> video recorder <laughs> and buys a couple of Disney movies and goes back to his, you know, $40 a night hotel room, figuring that he's on his dad's payroll and I'm just going to try and save the money. It's dad's money. Mm. Wow. And he watched Disney movies. <laughs> oh, man. What a kid. No, a kid truly in a in a kind of a he man's was, game. He, he, that, ex but. That's exactly right. He was very immature, I think, at that age. It's and weirdly child. enough, when this story came up, Nathan was 24 when he was arrested and my son was 12. And my son mm -hmm. is now 24. And I asked, as I, I was writing the book, if I betrayed my country, how would you feel about that? If I, if I had done something like this? He said, well, I... <laughs> I, you know, I'd hate, hate the crime, love the criminal, but, you know, I'd forgive you and I'd still love you, but I'd be really mad as hell. And <laughs> I don't think Nathan was capable of being mad as hell at his dad. I <laughs> think that was the difference between Nathan and his dad and, and, and I think probably fathers and sons everywhere else. I think, I think a kid would, would typically be angry about that and not yeah. want to participate. Yeah, I agree. It still kind of boggles the mind. Even there's a lot of factors, obviously. I mean, there's there's every factor possible there really, but it's it's still kind of hard for me to see how he would do this and not see where it was all going or what the origin point of it was or anything like that. So I I, I feel a lot of empathy for him, but I, I don't see it playing out any way other than how it did. You know, and I don't know if he ever thought through to the logical, you know, end here, the logical consequence of all these actions, but I guess here we are. And I think there's another th issue here. I think it's possible that when Nathan drove and parked around the corner from the Russian consulate the very first time that his plates were picked up. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it's very possible, and this, I've never been able to verify this, but I've always had a s suspicion, a strong suspicion that that's another way that they picked up on him besides the strange comment that he made to his dad about making the, the sale for 5K that was picked yeah, up by the yeah. agency. I, I, I think that it's possible the FBI also participated in that, but I have no evidence of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it would make sense that they would kind of keep some of their cards close to the chest and kind of deflect attention away from certain methods and tools. Exactly. And, Nobody and wants to say, yeah, we have agents <laughs> walking the streets. We've got cameras on every every window. We're doing surveillance as much as we can do on that building. You know, we're following people home. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you and know. you know, that brings up a point. If, if you don't mind, I want to backtrack just for a second. Honestly, something that you said and something that you wrote about, but CIA analysts reading everything that Jim said from prison. I mean, that does not seem like a CIA function inside the United States to me. Was there some sort of special dispensation or, you know, any, any anything right there? Because I would anticipate an FBI analyst maybe doing that. But CIA, 
you know, listening in on conversations in the United States, you know, is a, is a little bit surprising. Maybe it shouldn't be, but it is. Well, there wasn't an open investigation, so the FBI wouldn't have w- wouldn't have had that that right. license at that point. But the CIA was able to establish what they call the predicate, right? Which is, hey, <laughs> <laughs> something's going on here, and then the FBI with enough evidence, could open a criminal investigation, which is precisely what happened. The CIA mm-hmm. analyst spots it at, at CIA ho- headquarters, passes the information on to the FBI, ultimately the travels to the FBI, and sure enough, you know, the CIA officers who went over there said, you know, we think he might be up to it again. Here's some evidence. You might want to be able to get some uh, FISA orders going and keep tabs on a young Nathan Nicholson. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was obvious justification for doing it because he was involved in espionage and his son was involved in espionage. I'm still surprised that they were playing that long game. Do you think that they had a suspicion that he would try something from prison or were they just being very thorough at that point? I think they were just being very thorough. And I think that the agency, I think it is standard operating procedure if you have a spy like Alder James who has been locked up to monitor everything that they utter, think about uttering or or write. And I've been able to, to correspond with, with Rick Ames a couple of times over the years. And I think I spoke to him on the phone once or twice. And I'm sure those, those records are somewhere in a, in yeah, a, in yeah. a CIA repository. Yep. I, though I they were imagine. very benign. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, people probably call him for the same reasons, especially a journalist. You know, you're going to have a, a fairly, you know, what, I'm, what I put it, expected set of questions, I guess to ask. So there wouldn't be anything surprising in those recordings for somebody, you know, listening in in that same situation, I guess. Mm -hmm. So how did things end for Nathan anyway? I mean, how was, how did the investigation that you mentioned earlier, how did it proceed? So let me just tell you how the, how they operated. Can I start with that? Absolutely. Yeah. So Jim came up with this plan to meet privately with Nathan in the prison visiting room at Sheridan, Oregon. This is the Federal Correctional Institution, Sheridan, which is about 50 miles from where I sit here in Portland. Hmm. And the idea was that while they were sitting in the visiting room in these sort of chair, you know, these, I forget what they call them, but they're like airport chairs. They're all in a row, you know, and they're all connected with each other and bolted to the floor. Jim's idea, I think, was to get Nathan to be able to smuggle messages out. So it was Jim's plan, and he wanted Nathan to carry those messages out, and he he tasked him sort of the way you would expect any case officer to work any other asset, right? He had him carry these notes out, and he said, I want you to do this. I think this would be a good plan, and what do you think? And you know, ultimately, Nathan was the one who was coming up with the way to conceal these notes in the prison visiting room. And here's how it worked. Jim would sit down. He would make sure that Nathan came a half an hour or an hour early before his sister showed up or his brother showed up or his Jim's parents showed up. And that gave them enough time for them to eat a snack, have a couple of cold drinks or coffee or whatever in their seats and catch up. But meanwhile, they were creating a little pile of trash in the little table between them. And Jim would very quietly slip a note under the trash. Nathan would then pick up the tray of trash and carry it to the trash can, palm the note, (laughs) stick it in his pocket, go to the bathroom, and stick it under the sole of his shoe, right? Under the, in the insole, and Mm -hmm. put his shoe back on and walk out of the prison. And it was pretty good tradecraft if you're going to sneak something out of the prison, right? right? But this was Jim's idea, but Nathan was trying to improvise by the whole putting it under the sole of his shoe thing, and he had provided a few other things along the way. I'm suddenly blanking on what they might have been, but but Jim was able to pass these notes to him, which were actually notes to the Russians. Nathan was, quite truthfully, a courier. Right, and right. And he was... He was a courier for this espionage, this this second act of espionage between Jim and the SVR. And what the SVR wanted was to find out how Jim and when Jim might have fallen under suspicion so that they could do sort of an an after-action report 
and figure out where they went wrong. I'm sure they were also thinking about whether, you know, somebody like Zoporoshky was involved, right? And it may have even been an investigation of Zoporoshky at this point. And hmm. so, but anyway, they would, yeah, they would sit and talk and they would trade notes. And at one point, there's this, this crazy scene in the book, you probably read it, where Star comes in and picks up the tray of trash and says, let me go take care of this. And Nathan, Nathan, Nathan says, no, 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 no. This is, this is men's work. You sit down and talk to dad. Let me carry this over there. And, oh. you know, he grabs the note out of there and 86 is the trash. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is pretty clever. I have to admit, and they got away with it for quite some time, didn't they? Well, yeah. And Nathan traveled the world carrying his dad's notes to the Russian handler. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then he carried back notes from his Russian handler to his imprisoned dad. <laughs> That's what he did. <laughs> wow. Wow. That kid. Yeah. So how long did this go on? It was a couple of years or longer. So it began in 2006. I want to say spring of 2006. I mean, seven years ago, I could have told you the exact date it started. Oh, right. Now, right now I got, now I'm just doing seasons here. I think it was spring of 2006. And it lasted until they were rolled up in 2009. Okay, so over three December years. of 2008. Yeah, actually. Ah. Yeah. yeah. So about I two see. years. So you mentioned rolled up. How were they rolled up exactly? Was was Jim eventually like re-arrested in prison? I don't even know how that works, honestly. He was. Yeah, it's a really crazy scene. I can tell you. Who do you want to know about the arrest first, Jim or Nathan? I'll tell you both. Probably Nathan because he was on the outside, I think. Sure. So Nathan was at his place. He had just come back, I believe, from... Cyprus, and he had been, unbeknownst to him, under investigation for some time and had been tailed by the CIA in Cyprus and the FBI as well. They were conducting surveillance of him all across Cyprus. But anyway, he comes back and he goes to sleep and wakes up to a thump, thump, thump on the door. And he looks out the peephole and he sees two guys that are clearly FBI agents in plain clothes. And he basically just pretends not to be home. And ultimately the knocking continues and he realizes they know he's there. And so he opens the door, they introduce themselves as FBI agents, and they come in and say, do you mind if we ask you a few questions? And he doesn't know enough about the FBI to say, come back another day, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh my uh, gosh. And invites him in and because he's a nice guy, right? I mean, he wants to, you know, you know, and he, he's talking to them and he, they're asking him questions about his travels and this sort of thing. Meanwhile, these are the agents who had already been, had already sort of intercepted him on his way back from a trip. I'm not trying to remember where he was. I think he was coming back from Lima, Peru. He was coming through Houston and they intercepted him. They flew to Houston and the they got the customs officers to detain him, you know, like they would do anybody that, you know, mm -hmm. might have done something wrong or somebody just a random check or whatever. And somehow the FBI agents got a hold of his backpack without being on the floor with the, the customs people. I guess one of the customs people must have carried it back to the office. But anyway, they had no printer or anything back there. All they had was his backpack with, you know, his Walkman or whatever, and which is kind of dating this whole story. But <laughs> there was a notebook in there. Where Nathan had been taking notes when he was talking to his handler, his Russian handler in all of these different meetings. So ultimately, Jared Garth, Agent Jared Garth, starts furiously scribbling on a pad of paper everything that was in the notebook. And I mean, ultimately, they 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 seize the notebook in a, you know in their raid. But and it you know it was basically the kinds of questions they were asking Nathan to ask his dad. So ultimately, they do show up. Two thousand nine, I think it was January two thousand nine. They came in and. And arrested him, took him to jail, and uh, he was accused of conspiracy to act as an agent of a foreign government, which is a, you know, an espionage charge. Mm -hmm. And the conspiracy, of course, being with his dad. So that's how Nathan was arrested. He he did a long investigation. There was a long day of, of attempted interviewing, and, and Nathan lied and lied and lied. And Agent John Cooney said, "Okay, listen, I'm going to give you a mulligan. <laughs> You've been lying to us." 
I want to tell you right now, it's a federal crime punishable by a prison term, a significant prison term, if you lie to the FBI. We're going to just forget this ever happened. We're going to give you a mulligan. And Nathan took the mulligan and told them everything. Hmm. They didn't arrest him immediately. They allowed him to stay home so that they <laughs> they had wiretapped his phone. And, of course, people are calling him. And there are these very famous phone calls between he and his sister. You know, what's up with the FBI? <laughs> a young woman named Camilla Beavers, who I think Nathan sort of fancied at one point, and they were college buddies, I think. She she called. She was in Austin, Texas, and they had stopped in to talk to her there. And she says, you know, explain. The first, her first words in the call are, explain. And he goes, well, it's <laughs> kind of a long story. <laughs> and then he explained that he was, you know, working for the Russians. And oh my gosh. And she's laughing all the way through it. And and she said, I thought Russians were pretty cool. He goes, They are. They're really cool people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, man. oh man. So Jim's arrest is is much more interesting. Jim was in his prison cell or somewhere in the prison and is summoned to a break room somewhere. And special agent Scott Jensen sits down with him and Scott had very clearly been in Cyprus or at least had known somebody who was in Cyprus doing their surveillance on Jim. I don't think Scott has ever acknowledged that he was actually in Cyprus, but he might've been, hmm. I think he was. And he sits down with Jim, didn't say a word. He just he introduced himself. I'm Scott Jensen with the FBI here in Portland. And then he slid a postcard <laughs> across the table that said, Welcome to Cyprus. <laughs> oh, wow. And the look on Jim's face was priceless, as Scott describes it. They had a fairly brief chat, I think. And Jim basically said, I haven't done anything wrong. Nathan hasn't done anything wrong. You know, go pound sound, basically. And they had enough very soon thereafter to arrest him. And they did. They arrested them both. Hmm. Well, wow. so Nathan, I mean, he's a, uh, he, he's made some serious errors to say the least, but he's also a pretty sympathetic guy. So is that how the jury saw it during his trial? Not only did the jury see it, but I think the U S attorney's office, the prosecutors saw that. I think the judge very clearly saw that. I think anybody hmm. with half a brain saw that Nathan was a dupe. His dad had really, really taken advantage of him. And had it not been for Jim Nicholson, Nathan would have never done anything criminal in his life. And mm -hmm. uh, there it was. He did. And so there was a group, in fact, of women on the defense team. There were like five investigators that were part of a team that were working on this, you know, rare, rare spy case you know, here in the, the, the district of Oregon, you know, we, we get a lot of spy cases here, we get a lot of marijuana cases here, like, you know, bulk <laughs> marijuana cases, but we don't, we don't get I'll a bet. lot of spy cases. The five women really, really loved Nathan and really, really despised Jim. Mm. And they called themselves the mom squad and oh they were really looking after him. And I, I think they tried with some limited success to explain what what their dad, what, what, what Nathan's dad had done to him. And today he understands, but it was a long, slow process for him to realize that he had really been taken advantage of by his dad and hmm. that his dad had really intended to do this. And I think it, I think it hurt him deeply. I, I hmm. mean, I think he knew to a certain extent exactly what it was up, what, not exactly what Jim was up to, but he, I think he knew to an extent that his dad was up to no good, but I'm certain that he didn't know the extent of it. That's what I'm trying to say. I gotcha. I gotcha. Did Nathan, did he serve prison in the end? Serve prison time? So when Nathan was arrested, he was taken to the Multnomah County Jail here in Portland. And I believe he was there for either 71 or 73 days. It was less than three months before he was allowed to come out on bail. You know, he had to wear an ankle monitor and that sort of thing. And during that time, I think it's sort of poignant to, to point out that he had this ankle monitor and was 
pretty much confined to his home, but he was allowed to go out and take exercise. And there's a, a, a mountain down in the Eugene area where he was, was at the time, down south of Portland anyway. It's called Mount Pisgah. And he would go hike that mountain frequently, the ankle monitor and all, and really, really turn things over in his head. And I think, I think he ultimately recognized that he would always love his dad, but he really felt, I think, hurt by what it all, by all that had happened. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can certainly imagine that to say the least. That's quite an understatement. So what is his, to your knowledge anyway, what is his relationship with his dad now? Cause Jim is still in prison at the moment, I believe. And Nathan's been out for quite some time. Do so you still visit him, for example, Jim and Nathan can have no contact. Oh, as wow. far as I know, and I've spoken and I spoke to Nathan just recently. I mean, within the last couple of months anyway, Jim and Nathan were ordered by the by the court not to have any contact at all. And they put Jim, I mean, the, the judge, when she sentenced Jim, Anna Brown said, this is going to be hard time going forward, the hardest time that you can have. And so he's in the supermax in Florence, Colorado, hmm. the, the administrative maximum. And, you know, you're in your prison all but about 40 minutes a day. Although I understand at one point, Jim was working as a janitor and was able to get out and, and, and actually see other people, including Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, who was just down the hall, and, huh. and other people there on Bombers Row. Hmm. Terry Nichols, the one of the Oklahoma City Bombers, was on that. And oh, right, Hansen's right. still there. Robert Hansen's there, I think. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, I think, I think Jim is slated to get out in 2023, the last that I heard. Does that sound right to you? Yes. He got an extra... Eight and a half years, I think it was, in the second case. And so he would have been out. He would have been out already, but for the, the second act of espionage. Right. And so he right. is, right. he's 71 years old now, and he will be released. That's exactly right. It's actually November 26th, 2023. But I, I believe it was November 26th, 1996, that he was arrested. Wow. That, that Dulles. Yeah. Yeah, that's... It's coming up on 30 years ago, man. Time is flying. Yeah, yeah, sure is. So what is Nathan doing these days? I mean, wh how, how did he put the pieces of his life back together? So he? he has. He has done various jobs. I don't want to say too much about him because I don't want to violate his privacy, but he he is married to a lovely woman and they have a truly, and I, I'm, I'm not just saying this just to be nice, a truly adorable child. And <laughs> they, they are very private. They have a great family life. I think she has a good job. I believe he is currently employed. He was sort of underemployed for a while because of the felony record, but I believe he is employed and, and doing very well now. We have spoken a few times recently for, for various things. He just, he's the same sort of just ebullient young guy. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that he's he's improved things a little bit since then. Do you think, I know this is probably speculation on your part, but do you think that him and Jim, he and Jim will, will get back in contact after Jim is released? It's Yes, I'm sure that they will. When Jim is released, I'm sure that he and Nathan will will have that talk. I'd love to be a fly on the, on the wall for that conversation. Oh yeah. But that's a truly personal thing between them. I get it. And I, I'm not, I'm, you know, I, but I spent a lot of time with Nathan. I've spent no time with Jim. I'm hoping, and if Jim, Jim Nicholson is listening to this at some point that you will meet me and we will have a day long conversation because I think there's a, a hell of a story in whatever, whatever uh, Jim has to say. Yep. There absolutely is. And, and you're the guy better than anyone else, just about probably to ask the right questions about that story as well. So hopefully you get to write more about it with using his own words. I sure hope so. I sure hope so. You know, I, I there was no way to, I had to do a write around. I, I, the, the government forbid me from having any, any conversations with Jim. Furthermore, they put Jim on something called a special administrative measure. Are you familiar with this? No, I don't think so. So the Attorney General of the United States has the authority to place something called a SAM, a special administrative measure on prisoners that they don't want to be able to go public, which means they can't speak to media. And Jim was placed on a special administrative measure. There have been another of other, a number of other convicted spies and terrorists who are under special administrative measures. But 
What it does ultimately is it violates the First Amendment. And for the longest time, and if you happen to be a, a really good <laughs> national security lawyer out there and you want to take my case, I think the special administrative measures are, are, are unconstitutional. And I think the First Amendment should always stand up and the American people ought to be able to hear from people who have done terrible things to the country and, and not be shut down because the government doesn't want them to talk. Well. Wow. Yeah, well, I very selfishly agree with you completely on that because of the opportunities that it presents to get a lot more of this very important history out there, certainly. What are the argument, the, the government arguments for that anyway? Just it'll continue to do like harm to national security if they you know, talk more about what they did? I don't know just, what like, their fears are with Jim Nicholson. All of, his, all of the stuff that, that Jim gave up is sort of on the public record now. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, I, there's nothing in... I mean, there are probably some things that are not in my book because I don't know them. But in the pantheon of spies, Jim holds, you know, three superlatives. He's the highest ranking CIA officer ever convicted of espionage. He's the only one to do it from behind bars. And he's the only one to have pulled it off twice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I he's mean. Quite a guy. I think, I think he has a right to talk to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I certainly want to hear more of his story. I think a lot of the listeners right now do as well, despite any, you know, arguments against or arguments for, you know, keeping him quiet even after he's released from prison. But, of course, there's always a lot more of this history that I want to know that I probably never will know. Yeah, as, as uh, me too. <laughs> That's the nature of this subject anyway, this genre. So, Brian, I understand that you, you mentioned something about the movie at the very, very beginning. So is that something that's in the works right now? Well, I can't talk about the latest project. I will tell you that it was optioned for a feature-length film, a scripted, fictionalized version of the story, first by Paramount Pictures and then Cross Creek Pictures. And both of them sat it on the shelf. They paid screenwriters gobs of money to write the screenplays, and the films never got underway. Well, the first one they were going to hire, the, the two actors who had sort of signed on were, were um, Shia LaBeouf and uh, Robert De Niro to play the father and son. Oh, wow. Okay, and, I can uh, kind of see that, yeah. Yeah, I actually, I think I think if they were going to make a movie, if I, if I were a filmmaker and I had unlimited budget, I would hire Brian Cranston to play Jim Nicholson and, and Miles Teller to play Nathan. I think, I think Miles Teller is brilliant. I think Brian Cranston is equally brilliant, but I think Miles Teller could do Nathan in a way that would be really, really revealing and, and hmm. cool. And he's an amazing yeah, that would be actor. Good yeah. They're, they're two of my favorites, certainly. So I would, I would love to see that on the screen. And then there was a TV project that sort of came and went and it is now morphing into something really, really exciting. And I can't tell you what. Just okay. Yet. But something is coming basically. Something's right? coming. Okay, good. Is there a is there a time frame like a, a year, calendar year, anything like that that you can put on on or not? Really? I, I I can't say a word about it. <laughs> I okay. really can't. Yeah. But right. it's well, not it it's not way. imminent imminent. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I have time certainly. Fascinating stuff. So, are you working on another book right now? Anything that you can tell us about in the world of print, anyway? Well, I have another nonfiction true crime book in the works that I also can't talk about, sadly, but. Yeah. The the manuscript that's the, the manuscript that's really consuming me now is the most exciting thing that I've ever written, and it has nothing to do with spies. I have put off writing a novel for years and years, though I studied fiction writing as a as a co college student. It's the the thing that I'm writing now is the best writing and storytelling I've I've ever done, and I, I I'm, I'm sitting at my desk now. I wake up champing at the bit to to get to this desk. And oh, right. Wow. The novel is a story about family. It, it, I mean, there are some parallels, I suppose, with the spy side. It, it, this, it's a story about family and the really weird places that you find it, not just the blood family that you're born into, but the one that kind of forms around us. And it's told through the story. It's obviously fiction, but it's told through the story of America's best marathon runner, who is a hot mess <laughs> and is huh. forced to go home to his family estate in East Texas and confront some very dark secrets to prepare himself to run the perfect marathon. Oh, wow. That sounds pretty compelling. Uh, it's a pretty cool story. The characters are congealing a little bit more every day. I'm about almost halfway through it, and I love writing fiction. I One of the things about nonfiction is I'm a, you know, I've got mild ADHD, so every time, like, I don't know something, 
I, I'll spend an hour and a half researching. <laughs> and you don't have to do that with fiction. You can just write it. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, there right. is some, there, you have to do some research to make sure things are accurate, right? But it's not like you're writing something for uh, a major magazine. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. So, uh, Brian, where can my listeners connect with you right now if they want to learn more about your past and future projects? So, probably the best place to kind of find out about what I'm up to is my website, which is, you know, www.briandenson.com. And I should say that Brian is with a Y. So, it's B R Y A N D E N S O N.com. And same for the, the email. I mean, I take emails all day. Um, it's Brian Denson at rocketmail.com. Mm hmm. Yep, that's how we got in touch, I believe, wasn't it? Yeah, it is. Yep. Great. Well, thank you, Brian. This has been really informative. I look forward to whatever version of this story comes out on the screen one day. I might have to wait for a while, but it's certainly worth the wait. And for all my listeners, you know, we certainly did not tell the whole story here by any stretch of the imagination. There's some real twists and turns that we didn't cover here, like the way that Jim was able to sneak some messages out of the prison before. He got Nathan involved in the espionage. Some really interesting stuff there. Brian knows what I'm talking about, of course. Yep. But I encourage you to pick it up, certainly. Well, thanks again, Brian. I really appreciate you coming here. This has been really informative, and I look forward to what else you're working on. Much enjoyed this. Uh, this was great. A lot of fun. Great. Thank you so much. Take care. You too. Bye. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my pages on Instagram at Spycraft 101 and at cold.war.stamps. You can also find more great articles on my website, spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there is lots more to come. Disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The stories and statements expressed herein are experiences and opinions. They may not reflect the views of the host or the production studio. It's okay if you disagree with our content. No piece of media is right for everyone. If you love Spycraft 101, please check us out online, on Instagram, on YouTube, and especially on Patreon. Thank you for listening.